Welcome to Almost Here, Round the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Future Technologies, poised to transform our lives for better or worse, are the focus of this podcast. Almost Here means these technologies are now here and starting to be used, or just around the corner, from Bitcoin to artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech Podcast. Uh, My guest is Professor Siegfried Hakimi. He's at McGill University, Department of Biology, and we're going to be talking about uh, what he's doing in the Hakimi lab, dealing with aging and stress and, uh, you know, the biology of it all. So, uh, Professor, how are you doing? I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Yeah, And, you know, uh, it's uh, pot legalization day today in Canada. (laughs) Special day. Oh, well, tell me me about that briefly. uh, What is that? And what's that about? Well, marijuana is legal now in Canada from... Starting today, sent, sold in government shops. Wow. There you go. So after the podcast, are you going to run out and, uh, and try some? <laughs> well, <laughs> you can have, buy it online too. But, you know. <laughs> yes, it's going to be, people sometimes believe it's going to be a big, so, sort of bring a big social change. Don't really believe that. You know, people are just going to get used to the fact that it's legal and won't make much of a difference, you know. Yeah, I've seen in the United States and you know, I've been in states where it's legal and everything looks normal to me. Yeah, exactly. Nothing looks weird. There's no, there's no <laughs> creatures running, running the streets or crazy things happening. So. Exactly. Yeah, well, that's good. Good. Well, I'm glad. So tell me about um, your lab and your work there. What's that about? Yeah. So, well, we've been working now for close to 30 years on, on the biology of aging um, by using both nematode, you know, Abditis elegans, so a small worm. Uh, but one millimeter long, we live it on your know, petri dishes, which is very practical to study aging because it doesn't live very long and we can do good genetics. But uh, we also moved into using mice and then uh, using uh, you know, human cells and developing drugs. So we tried to kind of uh, pass from you know, very basic discoveries about aging using genetics to uh, attempt to actually act on aging by uh, drug development. And uh, that's what we've been been doing, uh, you know, for a long time. Okay. Um, with some, uh, uh, you know, our earliest thing, how we got into that, is because uh, I discovered even when I was still uh, before I had my lab, a postdoc in in Cambridge, England, um, mutants that uh, are long lived, and I was one of the very first to find such mutants, and our mutants were special or rather different from uh, the few other mutants which were already known at the time, which is they seem to affect, you know, metabolism, mitochondrial function, uh, things like oxidative stress, that is the, uh, um, you know, the potential damage by free radicals and uh, this sort of things. Um, and um, these have remained unique mutants to study this question uh, in aging. And it had allowed us to do something which was unexpected and I see as one of the one of the things which was fun to, to do some paradigm shifting, some fighting dogma, is that we found that, you know, so called reactive oxygen species, or so what people sometimes call free radicals, which produce which can produce oxidative stress. Uh, and people very much if you ask people in the street, believe maybe it's a cause of aging, or many people believe it's the cause of aging. This is why they consume uh, antioxidants, they buy antioxidants. Uh, actually Free radical damage does not cause aging, and almost to the contrary, uh, free radical increases aging because it helps the body to fight uh, aging. And um, that was a very interesting uh, finding, and a lot of our efforts. Uh, now... uh, oh, go yeah, ahead. I'm a little bit confused. So, yeah, free radicals they cause aging, or they help stop aging, or they what? help oh. stop aging. They, they, you know, people <laughs> for the days these so called. Uh, Oxidative stress theory of aging, which has been around for a long time, which suggests, which has suggested, still suggests that free radical cause aging, and it's based on a number of not unreasonable ideas. Uh, one of them, for example, is that when you the older an animal or the shorter lived an animal, uh, a species, the more you see elevated level of free radicals. You know, when you get older, you have more free radical generation in your cells, and this has been interpreted. You know. Although this is just a correlation, it has been inter- interpreted as being meaning that free radical cause aging. And what I believe we have been convincingly able to show is that no, 
free radical increase because they're part of a system to recruit defenses against the damage caused by aging. And that's why it's correlated with aging. And we have been able, for example, to show that we can increase free radical generation in our model animal species and prolong the lifespan rather than shorten it. Okay. And we've been able to show something similar for mitochondrial dysfunction. Free radical, one of the places where they produced is in mitochondria, which produce energy in the cells. And um, people have always, always believed that maybe damage to mitochondria from free radicals or from other causes is also causal to aging, because of course you need to make energy, you need your ATP for everything. Uh, but we've been able to show that clearly the level of damage that you see during aging in mitochondria does not cause aging, and even more profound damage does not cause aging. And here, too, there's some indication that maybe lowering energy production, which lowers the rate of all the processes in the cell, might actually help to live longer, to accumulate maybe you know, some molecular damage for a longer time. Um, well, how can you show that, that uh, free radicals help aging instead well, of... Uh, because, well, for example, because if you can uh, take a normal animal, or, you know, a non-mutant animal, and uh, give them uh, products that increase, you know, drugs that increase free radical, and this makes the animal live longer. Alternatively, or other type of experiment we've done, we have mutants, which where the mutations cause a, a damage. I mean, the mutation makes mitochondria function differently so that they actually produce more free radical. And not only do these mutants, in fact, live longer than normal animals, but when you treat these long-lived mutants with antioxidants, they now live as short as normal animals. So all the, these sort of um, uh, experiments and more well, <laughs> suggest what do, that... What do you think is the is mechanism yeah. by which more free radicals would, would help an yeah. animal live okay. longer? Good question. So free radicals, you know, you see them as toxic, but they're really only potentially toxic because in the body, they in, the, in cells, they are produced by various processes. And there's also a lot of very excellent defenses against, free radic against too much free radical or against po the potential damage free radical can produce because they are uh, reactive. Just like in your cells, there are mechanisms which prevent too much calcium accumulation so that the cell doesn't become calcified or many other things. So free radicals are produced by cells and they are under very good control in cells. doesn't mean that if you have much too much, it's not damaging, but that's only potential. In cells, free radicals are used as signaling messengers. So they're just like, I was giving the example of calcium or other things, they're intracellular messenger molecules, which help the cell maintain homeostasis by talking between compartments, etc. And in this role as messenger molecules, and not about nothing about the potential toxicity, that they are actually acting in pathways that help combat aging. And we've, you know... So they're making communication that. more efficient between the different parts of a cell? Yes, or maybe you're not a question of more efficient, it's more like it almost seems that um, the radical communication, you're right, is specifically involved in the sort of pathway that will bolster a cell's ability to maintain its homeostasis, to survive, to resist shocks, etc. It's as if, you know, this sort of mechanism, for some reason, particularly needs this sort of communication. So it's, it's even better than you having overall a cell that works better. It's like the way it works better is precisely, it seems, <laughs> um, for the sort of damage which we can observe occurs during our, our aging. So again, that's why we so I, I, we believe that's that's why we there's this correlation that the, the more aged you are, the more free radical you have. But it's not because the free radical causes the aging. It's because when you age, you need more free radical generation in the cell's attempt to constantly combat whatever damage uh, accumulates uh, because of the aging process. So you think it could be actually detrimental to try to take supplements or do things that absolutely. would reduce your free radicals? Pick down that, absolutely. So the, the good news is that probably most antioxidants that people buy and consume 
don't really work as antioxidant in your body, okay? They, they don't really change much, your, the redox state. And the other good news is that even when they do work, um, again, the body has very good mechanism to maintain its redox level, which means, you know, the balance between electrons bound and free are uh, um, um, at a set level. So the antioxidant won't do too much. But yes, they're potentially toxic. And it's very hard to um, to see because imagine, say, you're taking antioxidant and this increases your aging rate by a few percent, which certainly you don't want. This might be a few years, right? <laughs> but there's really no experiment or clinical trial you could easily do which could demonstrate that, okay? I mean, it would mean that you'd have two groups. I mean, not just ethically, but just practically and cost-wise, you can't really do this trial, okay? So when a compound you can buy over the counter or, or, or has been shown or not, has not been shown to not be acutely toxic, then you take it. And if it's only chronically toxic, you don't know about it. And, and given that it seems that, and there's been lots of in the study which has nothing to do with us, which people have shown that, consuming antioxidant has no beneficial effects. And forget that we have reason to believe it might even be bad, right? But certainly it has no beneficial effect. Then it's kind of tragic that people spend a lot of money. And we're talking in the developing world, it might be like a sensible fraction of the money they spend for food, you know, on antioxidant because they have been convinced by public opinion and now the industry of antioxidants and whatever and, and nutritional supplements in general that they should do that. That's good for their health. And as far as anybody knows nowadays, it doesn't do anything good and might even do something bad. Yeah, I've seen tons of advertising for years. You know, yes. I, I think that too, that you want to reduce free radicals. and you know. well, um, You said slowing down some of the um, metabolic processes yeah. appears to lengthen the life of uh, of yeah. various creatures. I've, I've learned about calorie restriction right. as a possible mechanism for that, but Absolutely. what other mechanisms could cause well, machinery to slow down? Right. So calorie restriction, it's not clear that it actually slows anything down. And to my mind, though opinions might differ, uh, I don't think we know how calorie restriction works, meaning why in some strains, because you know, in some mouse strains, for example, where it works very well, um, Calorie restriction can have such a big effect on lifespan, meaning increasing it. It's not entirely clear that it's by slowing down metabolism or doing something more twisted than that. Okay, <laughs> um, and uh, but the other me the mechanism we've been studying, where we've seen that, is simply a mechanism where uh, the mitochondria function at a slower rate, so they actually consume food more slowly and produce ATP more slowly, and somehow the cell can accommodate with this by slowing everything down. And in part, this seems to increase lifespan. Um, it's interesting even for people, although there's currently no way to intervene, but because we don't know that the thing we're interested in, say at which rate we are thinking or feeling or whatever, is directly influenced by our metabolic rate. Um, you know, I mean, you know, there are probably big differences of metabolic, the sufficient differences of metabolic rate between people. Some people have very energetic lives and others less so. And it doesn't seem to change anything to their mental state. So maybe even for people, there's a possibility to slow down their overall metabolism. It might make them slower walking up the stairs, but who cares, you know? <laughs> and this might be good for the lifespan, but again, definitely not demonstrated for people or even not well demonstrated okay. for mice, you know. Well, you've been doing this for 30 years, so what, what are some of the really interesting... I mean, you mentioned it already that, you know, yeah. free radicals yeah. may actually, uh, you know, be assistive in the aging process. Yeah. What other surprises or things have you found that uh, either run contrary to common knowledge or are just interesting? You know, what have you figured out in the puzzle of aging that you think right. is important? Right, Um I mean, in a way, I... Mostly, I, I I rest that by saying it's these two things really. It's been the well, well, you know, very initially we, we go if you go back to the start, simple fact that we could have uh, mutant strains uh, of worms, but you know, never mind worms, where we changed, for example, only two base pairs in the entire genome, right? Changing two amino acids in two proteins, yet you can have an animal that now lives 
five times longer than the normal animal for two base pair changes in the entire genome. Well, that was a real biological surprise. My uh, evolutionary colleagues here at McGill, they teach our papers just for this fact, <laughs> because people had this notion that aging is the ultimate multifactorial thing, and it was a purely quantitative thing. And the fact that we can actually change an animal's function to such a degree in terms of aging by changing almost nothing in the structure of the animal even though we don't completely understand how, com how this then brings about such a long lifespan, but the simple fact that you can, that was definitely a surprise. And um, then there was a surprise later to find that mutants that damage mitochondrial function, right, which make it worse and increases ferratic, I mean, what we were discussing earlier, that, you know, make mitochondria work less well and uh, damage and increase ferratical doesn't make you live short, but makes you live long, uh, that was the next surprise, and then, as we discussed earlier, we you know, studied that until we understood what was, what actually, what was actually going on, you know, and, and, and that was interest. And, um, you know, um, that's definitely been, you know, I would say, the biggest surprises. Um, um, since then, it's not that there are not other things, but we all got, got used to the fact that aging can be studied like when we study development, you know, by, by using genetics, by using model systems, by intervening with drugs. In a way, we've been used to that. But in the early days, this was new that you could do this on a feature such as aging, you know, that was quite exciting. So animals living five times longer, that's, that's a huge change. It's not just 10% longer, but five yes. times is incredible. Yes. Um, what, what was different about these animals? You, you well, said they had a, a base pair switched, but what else did you notice like uh, well, okay. about them? What, what made them different? One thing is these animals, which had such large effects, but it's not necessarily... The one we studied also were slow, meaning, you know, they, they, the rate of living and all the sort of things you would mind to measure was slow. But this is not necessarily the case. You can obtain very large increase in lifespan, which animals which seem to be functioning at the same sort of weight uh, than normal animals. And as I, you know, as I said earlier, you know, opinions vary. Some people think they know what's going on or whatever, but I think we don't really understand what changes allow this. Um, it's because we don't really understand what the cause of aging is. And when I say we don't understand the cause of aging, what I mean to say is the proximal or physiological cause of aging. What is it that really um, gets damaged and cannot be repaired properly? Okay. Some people believe it's not like that. It's a program. Aging is like development. There is a, something ticking, okay? and when you tick to X time, then you die. But I think the evidence for this is very weak, and aging still very much looks like an accumulation of damage. The problem here is we don't know what that damage is. And that's one of the reasons people loved the oxidative stress theory of aging, because then we had the impression that we knew what the damage is. It's, it's free radical damage, okay? And that's what accumulates, and, and there's more and more damage, and can't all be repaired, and now the thing falls apart. But it's not clear at all that that is the case, and, um, and so we don't know what the damage is. To go back to free radical damage, you might have heard of um, your naked mole rats, which are a rodent model of animals which live a very, very long time and uh, is now, has been studied by a number of people and it's now studied also by Calico Lab, you know, the Google company who works on aging. And naked mole rats are interesting because they, they are the size of mice, but they live 10 times longer than mice. And their um, steady state, the base level of free radical generation and damage is much higher than mice. Another demonstration or proof that free radicals certainly do not even correlate well with, with aging per se, let alone what role they play. You know, um, so. But again, but if you look, don't know um, why. Go longi ahead. If you look longitudinally at a normal animal versus mm -hmm. a mutant animal, have you looked at the the rates of damage over time to the mitochondria, for instance, and have you looked at the condition of cells, yeah. and it, are you able to do a scales. side by side comparison? Uh, it's a good question. It kind of scales. So we. We, people have looked little of that because it's harder than you think <laughs> um, uh, in terms of, you know, how do I say, standardizing everything and having measure you can truly believe. Um, but essentially for these mutants who live a very long time, 
we kind of it it sort of scales. It's not like suddenly you're seeing something that never happens at all, right? It just happens at the equivalent time of their lifespan, say at 50% of their lifespan, even if it's a longer lifespan. You see the same level of damage, etc. So we we can't we haven't identified what is not going wrong specifically because everything seems to be just scaling and it kind of makes sense because you know think about human disease if you were to uh, uh and it's already happening a little bit right if you some prevent people of dying from heart disease and cancer then they live a little bit longer and all die from neurodegenerative diseases so if you want people to live two times longer then you have to affect all diseases in parallel Right? Otherwise, you'll just be killed by the next one, even if it normally starts a bit later. You know? So you have only very small increments. Um, if to obtain a very large increase in lifespan, therefore, you, you need to, to really touch the basic mechanism of aging. And this is, seems to what we have done in this mutant, even if we don't know what this basic mechanism is and how come in the mutant, therefore, it, doesn't, it allows for longer lifespan. So, um... Yeah. Is a hard question. We don't always have the answer. We most of the yeah. research you do is to create a question, right? So. That's true. So, so things follow a certain trajectory and a path, but they mm. could they follow it just at different time scales. You're saying in the mutants, that's right. The, the same things happens in the mutants. It just happens over a longer time period. That's right. And and therefore mm. something must be happening more slowly in the mutant, which is the basis of it all. And we don't understand where that is. Um, some people think they understand. Do you understand? I mean, I, I guess know. what I would do is study different parts of the trajectory, you know, like, mm-hmm. and I'm sure people are doing this, but is there any insight at different stages of the trajectory on what's going on? Or is it just the whole thing a mystery? One thing is the question of the trajectory. I am not aware that people have found that, you know, special things happen at special times in the long-lived mutants, Okay. Meaning, you know, it's all to do that, you know, when they're young, there's no damage, and then, then the damage starts later and so on. A little bit, but it's not quite clear. Maybe caloric restriction is a bit like that, meaning that, um, you, know, it, you know, the animals stay younger for long and then start, to f- start aging at the same rate as normal animals. But for the mutants which affect uh, mitochondrial function, for example, it's more like during the entire lifespan, for any interval, they have aged less, you know. Um, but this doesn't give you a mechanistic insight of what is it, what it is that's not getting damaged. What forces that actually causal to aging is happening more slowly. There are hypotheses. So, for example, one hypothesis is that it's epigenetic, right? So our cells have very complex regulation to function. Some of them we know and others we don't know. And there's a whole level of feedback mechanism with 18 different, you know, <laughs> loops which all support each other, um, which allows the cell to function optimally, okay? And, um, and maybe some of these are labile. So when you build them, when you make a new organism, all fresh from an intact cell, you know, uh, during development, it's all in place. And then slowly these things fall apart in a way which is not instantaneous, but, you know, you slowly lose a little bit of regulation, a little bit of regulation, etc., etc. And there is no good way to rebuild it de novo while maintaining the organism alive. And, you know, I know it's a bit (laughs) hand-waving, but, um, you know, something... Like that's going to be hard to study. Um, um, every cause of aging so, is hard to identify because you're always going to have the problem of um, a cause and effect because everything seems to become less well regulated with aging. Therefore, when you find something that's less well regulated and you say this is causal to aging, it might just be a consequence of aging and not a cause. So it's just hard to so the animals where you did the genetic engineering and switched the base pairs so they live mm-hmm. longer, did you do that uh, when they were embryos or did you do that when they were already adults? Uh, it, that doesn't make a difference. So we, it's, it's for the whole, no, so these animals, uh, we're talking about viable strains. There's no problem, you know, they, they, are, they are mutants forever and, um, and they produce mutant progeny which live long, you know, everybody lives long. It's not a, it's not a development versus other change thing. But the truth is, it's being said that people, at least for some of these mutants, have tried to 
turn off for alters the function of the gene only in adults, and it still increases lifespan a lot. So it, it's not purely developmental, you know, developmental setting or something. It's actually something that acts throughout. Well, again, and that's true also for increased adult, free radicals, you know. Was it's it almost, an adult animal that you did gene therapy on, or was it an embryo that you did gene therapy on that was born in Originally, we didn't do gene therapy. Originally, we just identify mutants which have random mutations, and then you find a mutant which has certain properties, say long life. But the mutation were produced randomly by giving them mutagen. Nowadays, we have CRISPR. Well, that was a very exciting development um, in terms of technology. We have CRISPR. We can engineer this mutation. But originally, we just identified mutants which were produced spontaneously and then went and looked what was the mutation which gave the properties we were looking at. But now that there's CRISPR, what have you done? Have you tried mm. it on mm. adult oh, animals? Yeah. So with CRISPR, absolutely, we, so we're using CRISPR routinely because CRISPR is beautiful because it allows you to speed up a lot of that. It allows you to use much more of the background information you already have about how cells function to play with very, very precisely with some processes and, um, and therefore to, to, to have much more you know, high-resolution experiment. So I can, for example, give you an example. So as we explained earlier, we, we believe that free radicals um, are, are regulatory molecules and signaling molecules. But to do this, they have to modify some proteins and they do this on modifying the amino acid cysteine okay they oxidize the amino acid cysteine on, a, on protein x and then this protein ch can change its function because it's modified by the free radical and this represents the signal so what we can do with crispr what we have done is to replace the cysteine with a very similar amino acid uh, a serine but should cannot be oxidized so now the molecule is which was whose function is maybe changed from free radical, becomes deaf to any free radical uh, 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 signaling. And we look at the consequences. And we did this, for example, with the oncogen RAS, which was shown to be sensitive to free radicals and might be even involved in the ability of free radicals to increase lifespan and um, have very interesting results. We can also trans change the cysteine to an aspartic acid, which mimics being oxidized. You know, so all this, you know, one amino acid at a time change uh, in one protein, which really allows, you know, great precision in the hypotheses you're testing, you know, kind of decreases the hand waving a little bit. But, yeah, again, have you, have you tried the genetic the gene therapy on young animals and old animals and middle-aged animals? And if so, what have you seen happen? if you introduce the gene therapy at different ages? I'm not sure I understand. It it's essentially makes no difference. I mean, but it's not really the way it works. You, you're not actually, you know, I know you're thinking about humans where, where people hope to use CRISPR on a particular tissue, say muscle, and then, you know, they repair something in muscle and so on. But when you do this for experimental animals, you do it in, if you want, in the germline. You, you modify the germline of one mother in order that it produces progeny that's already mutant for the change you want to engineer. So it's always the whole animal doing its whole, whole lifespan, okay? Um, what you're thinking of is like more like when people want to use CRISPR, for example, to cure specific diseases which are already present in, you know, somebody who, who, who has a genetic uh, problem, like, uh, and has been shown, for example, for muscular dystrophy, where then you try to use CRISPR right away on the muscle to, make, to repair something. What we're talking about here is more like a technological way to engineer mutant animals where, which are mutant from birth. Oh, so you haven't, you haven't uh, tried to do gene therapy on an adult animal to turn it into a mutant? No, it wouldn't know how to do it, really. It wouldn't it, work? It, it would be very difficult because imagine you would need to be able to target virtually all its cells. What you can do is okay. having you know, a little subset of cells, one particular tissue, one cell type, and even that's hard because then you have to be able to target it to, to get the, the whatever produces the CRISPR in there, only there, right? But that's what, again, some people try for some diseases. But for this sort of studies, we haven't tried that. I'm not sure it's easy to do. You know? Okay, got it. Um, so what, what's next uh, for your lab? What's coming in the near future that you're going to be working on? Uh, yeah, Where so is the experimentation we, 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 we are most we are, we are We are doing 
you know, as I said, some of these studies using CRISPR to dissect things at a single amino acid level of how uh, free radicals help rather than damage, you know. Um, and the other big thing we're doing is we're doing drug development in the space of modify of mitochondrial diseases and um, how mitochondrial dysfunction, uh, when it's too severe, produces disease, but maybe where if it was much less severe, it would actually be beneficial. So that you can't just go and say, well, you know, we want only to boost it or we want only to decrease it. You have to find the sweet spot. And uh, we are... We are doing a lot of drug discovery also in a particular space, which is the space of coenzyme Q, ubiquinone, which is a lipid-like molecule, which is necessary for mitochondrial electron transport, um, and for which there are, um, there are some people who, who have mitochondrial ubiquinone deficiencies. They, they lack uh, the ability to make normal amounts of this molecule. And uh, we have a, you know, mouse models and uh, a drug screen for this, and we've been successful in actually finding um, a compound which helped to absorb ubiquinone, which is very, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm using some terms interchangeably, ubiquinone, coenzyme Q, CoQ10, it's all the same thing, um, just different names for it. And so these are molecules that's very hard to absorb, and we found a way to, to, to boost this a lot, and actually um, trying to to, to, to start a spin-off. I start, had a spin-off company like 15 years ago for about 10 years from our work here on aging. And, and now on this particular field of uh, uh, ubiquinone deficiency, uh, we are also again trying to get a spin-off starting for drugs we've already discovered while at the same time finding new ones. You know. So it seems like uh, aging is, is a programming of our genetics. It seems like we just don't understand maybe the mechanism, but it, there's a whole orchestration that comes from our genes that you know sets in motion these events that cause us to age or all, all creatures to age is what it I, seems like. I, I don't know. I don't think so. I think it's, it's a secondary effect. It's not like programmed to happen. It's more like, it's more like neglect, okay? So <laughs> right? it's not like there's a little program or machinery that makes you age. It's just that the machinery that prevents you from aging, meaning what is aging in that sense, falling apart slowly, okay, is not perfect. It's not optimal. It's clearly there because if I kill you, each of your cells is going to fall apart a lot faster than it um, falls apart while you're alive, okay? So there's a machinery that prevents you from falling apart. But what you are suggesting is that there's a machinery that makes you fall apart. And I'm not sure there's any evidence for that. Hmm, okay. So, what we want to do is to, what we would want to do in a big view thing is always to find what, what makes things fall apart or what things fall apart first or more crucially and then boost the machinery that makes it fall apart slowly to make it fall apart even more slowly, okay? Um, rather than, than blocking the machinery that makes you fall apart because I don't think there is a machinery that makes you fall apart. There's just a machine here that prevents you from falling apart, and it's not working well enough. All right, that makes sense. What you're trying to find, you know? Well, what's, what's your gut tell you? How many different types of machinery and how many different places uh, is the uh, machinery being used to prevent but, you from falling apart? So, so some people believe, you know, it's just entropy, which means that everything falls apart in parallel. You know, so there's really no specific mechanism in cells that you can address because they all fall apart in parallel. Okay, even if you say that, and, and I don't like that theory just because it's very hard to test, and I think untestable things are not that interesting. Okay? But but nonetheless, even if you say that, then still mitochondria might be the place to act because it's still true that two functions of cell use. I mean, we're starting talking thermodynamics here. To uh, function the cell needs uh, energy, and uh, if it's just slowly falling apart by entropy, if you give it less energy and the cell can still function but more slowly, it might still allow it to fall apart more slowly by entropy. But I think there is also reasons to believe that it's not true that everything falls apart and that there's some thing which are harder to maintain than others, which then secondarily, you know, becomes deleterious for the whole cell, and we can still try to identify that. 
Um, and the experiments I was telling you about earlier, for example, that you know we can have animals that live a lot longer than normal animals by changing very few things in them, suggest that maybe there's not that many things that need changing, uh, or that you know you can fix a few things and then secondarily it'll fix a lot. Okay, um, that there's something are more fragile. Um, to you know, aging, if you want to, you know, something fall apart more quickly than others, and then just pull the others behind them, and then if you intervene on these, then we, we have a chance to slow things down. Okay. This is a somewhat well. theoretical con- consideration, you know, in the absence of really understanding the mechanism. But what what everybody does is always a mixture of, you know, trying to have new concept, new ideas, and yet in some em- more empirical kind of you know, trying to find a drug that works. And you kind of worry later on how it works, okay? If you're having a good screening mechanism for such a drug, then finding the drug would be a first step, and then, which you then can use to find out what does the drug do, you know? So one always does a little bit of both, you know? Is it possible right now for people to uh, do genetic engineering, even though it probably wouldn't be allowed, but to do genetic engineering so that the children that they would have would live a lot longer than uh, normal people? I don't think we know what to change to, make, to do this. So I, I, I just don't think the knowledge is there to do that, even if people wanted to try, you know. We, we, I wouldn't know what to change <laughs> and, and, and be confident this is going to be good rather than bad, okay? I, I don't think there is... Right, well, you a, wouldn't want people creating a race of, uh, you know, long-lived, like, superhumans. Uh, well, they wouldn't yeah. be superhuman. Like, come on. Okay, this, I thought something worth talking about. This is a misconception. The misconception is the following. You know, sometimes people say, also tell me, well, but you know, if people live longer, then we have a problem for resources on the planet and so on. But you know, demography, how many people are around and any place at any given time, is almost entirely driven by, nata- by birth rate and not by death rate. So when you increase lifespan by people by 15%, which would be a lot, right? People would pay for that, a lot, okay? Um, this is nothing, that's 15% compared to now people in Canada have 1.2 children rather than 17 previous generation, okay? <laughs> that changes how many people are around, not if you make the people who are there live a little longer. Um, so I don't think that, you know, there is anything known, you know, the, the sort of effect you can hope for in our effort to understand aging um, and intervene pharmacologically, say, um, it's not the same order of magnitude than when really changes the population structure, you know, which is all to do with birth rate. Um, yeah. It might actually have a reverse effect if, if it happened because then people would be in no rush to have <laughs> yeah. children. They may put it off forever. And so, yeah, maybe actually... No, yeah, it's good. actually, you're making another point, interesting point here. You know, people now are still in Westerners ca- countries, everywhere but more, much more in Westerners, Westernized countries, have children much later. And this, in fact, creates an evolutionary a selection pressure for still being healthy enough, especially for women, to, to be capable of having children, okay? Which means that on the long run, this will make people live longer because only those who are still physiologically young at the age where they have children will have children or rather they will have more children. And so this delay in the time of first reproduction might actually, on terms, you know, at a relatively long time scale, but at the level of the species, make people live longer, you know. That's sort of an interesting consideration. Another consideration while we're speaking of that is that, you know, we're talking about intervening and maybe making people healthier. But I mean, the biggest effect on lifespan you can imagine has already happened, which is that people live three times longer on average than two centuries ago. Okay. So your environmental condition, meaning your lifestyle, how hard you work, how well you feed, how warm you're in the winter, cool in the summer, all of it, this has a large effect on your lifespan. We are living a long time. I mean, I'm 62, and I'm in an unbelievably good shape. <laughs> uh, two centuries ago, I would have terrible, <laughs> uh, and probably would be dead, actually, probabilistically, you know. And um, right. this is really how easy my life has been and still is. I mean, you know, easy being you know, general concept. But all these things which protect us from harm, from physical stress in one form or another, actually allow us to live long, I mean, 
And this is a huge effect. This is an effect like the one we discussed earlier. This is a threefold effect. It's huge. And this right, is still well, in continuing. So in Canada, for example, um, the average lifespan is still increasing linearly and with no appearance of stopping. There you go. And, and how fast a rate does it appear to be increasing? Um, don't know, but uh, because I don't have it on top of my head, but what I see in my head is the, the line. It's just a straight line for now. It doesn't seem to be you know, flattening out. So it's increasing quite a bit. And uh, I think it's, if, I don't know, I don't want to give a silly number, but as, as I just said, you know, people now, life expectancy is above 80, okay? Well, definitely wasn't that, you know, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure it's like at least 20 or 30 years per century, you know? That's a lot. Mm, okay. Well, very good. I mean, you know, I could ask you questions for a, a long time, but I think we're out of time. No, so no what, what's the best way um, What's the best way for people to get in touch and to ask questions? Oh, it's email, for sure. Do you so have would my... you be okay to give that email? Yeah, I can give that email, no problem. I mean, uh, it's, it's sigfried.hakimi at mcgill.ca. So well, on your site, it's easy to have it. Oh, very good. Any Any last thoughts before we wrap up? No, not really. <laughs> I said a lot. <laughs> so there you go. All right, Professor. Uh, thanks okay. for coming. I really appreciate you being on the podcast. You're welcome. It was fun. Okay. Bye. Good day. You've been listening to Almost Here, Around the Corner of Future Technology podcast with Richard Jacobs. Subscribe to this podcast, post to review, to discover more future technologies that are poised to transform our lives for better or worse such as Bitcoin, artificial intelligence, 3D printing, blockchain, virtual reality, and more.